All right. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. Uh, appreciate you guys uh, attending. Just going to give you guys a uh, quick overview of the uh, Phosphorus cybersecurity pro uh, platform. When you uh, first log in, you're going to be greeted with a snapshot of your XIoT environment. So we've done, um, you know, discovery. We've identified what you have. Uh, right now, I'm actually showing our lab in uh, Nashville. So you can see one side of the lab here. Uh, our founders uh, are, you know, old school hackers. So you can see they've got their uh, payphone over here. You've got some crock pots. Uh, and then I actually have a close in video here of a phone. So I'll, I'll show you, tell you more about that a little later as I do the demonstration, because that's probably not the most exciting uh, thing that you'll see. Uh, now I'm Oh, okay. Sorry, it looks like we're not. Uh... Okay. Sorry about this. All right, how's that look? <clears throat> All right, sorry about that. So this was that snapshot screen that I was referring to, giving you kind of a view into what you have. Um, this is our lab here, which is in Nashville. So just giving you a, a quick show here. There's the payphone, everything that I mentioned. Um, and then this is a close up on one of the phones here. So we're going to be actually doing a firmware update on this phone a little bit later just to kind of show you how this works in action. So going back to the snapshot screen here, you can see we've got everything we've discovered. We identify new devices. We'll show you devices at risk. And this is one active site. So it's that site that I showed you. Uh, we actually support multiple sites. You can, you know, based on geography or tenancies, you can set that up as well. Um, here's a highlight into credential management. So we act as a gateway into your privilege access management platform, whether it's CyberArk or Beyond Trust or HashiCorp or Dicotic, you name it. We can integrate with those platforms and allow you to manage passwords uh, on your XIoT devices. Here's your most vulnerable devices. So we'll do discovery, we'll identify the devices that you have. Based on the firmware that we're running, we cross-reference CVEs and other information to identify the vulnerabilities and the severity of those vulnerabilities. We'll also highlight end-of-life devices. So we'll help you understand what devices are on your network that are no longer supported by the vendor, which means no more new firmware, and which means obviously you can't RMA or do other things like that, and you know, you're hitting eBay. So there's that disaster recovery risk. We'll give you views into vulnerable firmware and also risky configurations. So identifying things like Telnet being enabled and so on. Overall inventory being shown here as well, breaking it down by device types and everything is clickable. So you can go down and drill in and find out more information about the things that we discover. Uh, and then going down here, you've got the different alerts based on criticality, overall kind of response remediation elements, you know, your homework list, so to speak. Uh, as you uh, evaluate kind of what your stance looks like from an XIoT perspective. But yeah, let's get into the device view. So after we've done the discovery, we've identified everything here, we're gonna sort at all the devices that we've discovered by alerts. And these alerts are gonna identify, uh, you know, kind of the most vulnerable or the devices that have the most issues. So you can see that list here, you've got manufacturer, model, type, 
Um, we've got alert severities. You can filter on that. Like if you just want to see the high severity, you can do that really quickly. Um, you've got tags. So you can actually tag devices by their type. So if I just want to look at my cameras, for example, I can do that. Uh, tags are also utilized within the product for role-based access control. So a lot of our clients, right, they've got different teams. You might have a physical security team. So they're focused on cameras and door controls and building controls, things like that. Those people should have a different level of access to devices than perhaps your OT uh, folks or, or other people that are involved uh, within the environment. You can also go by type. Uh, manufacturer even. So this is a great one when you start looking at, you know, for example, the U.S. banning Huawei and ZTE. Uh, certainly a, a big concern for, for organizations uh, understanding if those types of devices are in the network uh, and so on. So if I click on one of these devices here, like this is one of the cameras, you can see the type of information that we pull with our discovery. Basic network information, uh, host name information, but also detailed metadata. So this is extremely important because accuracy and fidelity is where we have to be, you know, top notch. And so when you come down here and you look at what we support with this device, we support interrogation, which is our term for querying a device after we've already discovered it, talking to it in its native language, making sure it's up and it's healthy, password change and firmware update for this particular device. We also identify, based on our previous scans, what has been added, what's been changed, or what has been identified from a protocol, from a ports, and also a service perspective. And then as you go down here, you can see the active alerts that are uh, existing for this particular device. So it's got default credentials, it's a discontinued device, it's got out-of-date firmware, it's got vulnerable firmware, and it's got a vulnerable SSH server. So all of those uh, elements have been identified. I'm actually going to go back to my uh, camera here, which is 105. It's the one that I was just showing right here. And before I get into doing a firmware update, I want to click on this device and I want to show you real quickly what it look, looks like when we do a credential rotation. So basically the credential rotation I've already integrated into my privilege access management vault. Uh, and if you guys end up wanting to take a look at the product, Within our proof of value, we'll bundle the platform. It's just a single appliance, either virtual or physical, and it'll actually have a, a vault in there that you can use because most folks you know, don't use their uh, corporate vault uh, within a POV um, just to make it easy and clean. But it's very easy, right? I'm, I want to rotate the credential. I go ahead and do that. It's going to be very quick. We're API integrated in. I've gone ahead and I've changed the password on this camera. Now I'm showing you one device. We can actually do hundreds of devices at a time. We can do dozens, we can do two. You've got that flexibility. I'll show you that briefly, but I'm focusing on one device at a time. Password has been rotated. So I go back to my camera. I now have to sign in. I don't actually know the password anymore because I just rotated it. So I can go into actions, show device password. This is actually gonna connect into that PAM because we have the integration and query that password. We don't store any passwords. We only grab it from the PAM uh, based on these types of queries. And as you can see, here's the new password. Really nice, complex password. Uh, and that's another part of what our platform does for XIoT devices is we know the recipe for the complexity of passwords that these devices can handle. Because as you may or may not be aware, some of these XIoT devices or embedded devices uh, can only support certain components, right? They might not support special characters, or maybe they only support lowercase characters. We will make sure that the most complex password possible is applied to that device. So I've gone ahead and re-logged in here. I'm in. I'm going to go ahead and close this. And now we're back in. And something I'm going to do here quickly is I'm going to actually reset the password again and i'm going to set it back to default which in this for this particular device is pass and i do that for two reasons number one uh, i got to do this demo again later so <laughs> there's that uh, so i can show the credential rotation another time so i've logged back in here i'm going to go back to our video just so you guys can 
get back to seeing the stream that we were watching earlier. Now I'm gonna go ahead and query this device just to uh, simulate what it would be like if I uh, did another uh, discovery. And what you'll see here is we've identified that the password has been reset. Now, by me resetting that password back to the default, you know, out of the box, brand new uh, configuration, that's a simulation of what we call the paperclip attack. So, you know, I don't know about you guys, but in my home network, I'm guilty of a time or two having to reset my router or something like that, right? And you know the drill. You take the device, you pull the power, you hold down a paperclip into the pinhole, and then you power it up and you wait about 10 seconds or whatever it may be, and it resets the configuration and the password. And because I enrolled this into our privilege access manager, we've identified now, oh wait, that password's no longer what we set it to. So I'm gonna go ahead and update the credential. Now, we've got that now, we've, we've communicated that, we've validated that with the device, and now it's back into that PAM. Now, the other layer of that is, that's one of the metrics from an alert perspective that you can see here. So we can integrate with your SIM, your analytics platform, your ticketing platform, and you can see here, alert, password was reset, it's got default credentials, and that assigned credentials invalid. So that's an indicator. It could be an admin doing something, but it also could be somebody attempting to gain access, which you know is pretty easy from that perspective when you're talking about a device like that. Another thing I'm gonna do here, and prior to doing that, I wanna show you firmware. So this camera is another one of those cameras that I was looking at. You guys have probably had the same story, right? In my home network, I, use, uh, I have a Netgear switch. It's a 24 port. And I think it's been around for a while because every time I go to netgear.com, go to their support area, check for new firmware, I then have to know whether I'm a Rev 1, a Rev 2, a Rev 3, or a Rev 4 of that switch, right? Uh, and I don't always remember. I remember the model, but I don't necessarily remember the hardware revision uh, number. So sometimes I have to go under, you know, underneath my desk, find the switch, take a picture, or, or use a flashlight and figure out what Rev I have. So all of that is just work that I have to do, and that's just in my home, right, for one switch. When you talk about organizations that have hundreds of cameras, hundreds of printers, hundreds of PLCs, hundreds of door controls, whatever it may be that's an XIoT device, you've got to do that throughout all of those vendors and understand that. And so what we do here at Phosphorus for those types of situations, number one, it's fidelity. We understand exactly what the device is 100% from the hardware to the model, everything. Number two, we're a CDN, content delivery network for all firmware. So we scrape the internet with all of these authorized manufacturers. We download all the firmware and you can see this, this Axis camera has 44 different firmware versions and we're kind of towards the start of that journey, right? It started with the seven series, we're now in the middle in the eight series. You can see for each one of these, You've got all the CVEs identified. And if I, for example, wanted to go all the way to the latest one, I can do that. We handle everything, the pre-flight checks to make sure the device is healthy. We'll validate, okay, you gotta get to version you know, 9.2 before you can go to 9.8. We'll go through all of that. You can see the SHA-256, the MD5, all that information is there. And it's one ACL on your firewall for supporting all the vendors in your environment instead of having to allow access to netgear.com, to Cisco, to whatever it might be uh, for all the files. So that's one of the big uh, differentiators there. And now I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna do a firmware update on my Polycom phone. Now this is the one that we've been looking at with the camera. It's probably like the least sexy thing you've probably ever seen on film. You know, we're watching a phone, which is, you know, Number one, who has a desk phone these days, but this is actually very regular in, uh, in a corporate environment for sure. And the Polycom is actually really, really nice because these are very graphical when they do firmware updates. So that's one of the reasons we chose this for our, our demonstration. And don't worry, I'm not gonna make you watch a full 10 minute upgrade of a, of a phone, but I wanna at least show you kind of that kicking off. And so with the Polycom phone, similar to the camera, you know, you've got the, the firmware it is, the hardware, we've identified all that. The camera, this one's a little more simple. There's only a few options here. I'm actually gonna use this middle one because it's about half the size uh, of the latest. And so I go in here, I hit install firmware, I hit confirm. 
and away we go, right? I can go do other things like look at reports and other things like that. And I'll do that shortly. Now, first, I want you guys to see this kicking off. Uh, and I'll go back here periodically. And, and, and in fact, later on, I need to downgrade this before the next demo. So I'll, I'll downgrade as well. So we do upgrade, we do downgrade. And that's an important thing to recognize because there are scenarios, especially in corporate environments, new features may cause issues and, and all of that. And so if you want to roll back you can do that very quickly as well. Uh, so you may have caught that. It was contacting the provisioning server. That's us. Now it's in, it's doing a reboot uh, after it's downloaded the file and then it'll go proceed through its you know 10 minute update process. So that's firmware updates. And while that's going on, I'm gonna show you guys uh, some of the reports that we have um, and kind of help you identify that. Now, actually one thing prior to that, you can see here now it shows that this device is updating. Meanwhile, I can continue to look at all the devices in the environment. Um, if I pick, um, you know, um, pick another device here, one that has a certificate. No, that one doesn't. I'll just use this camera. So we also identify certificates on XIoT devices. Now I'm going to preview this because this is an important feature that we're going to be releasing in Q4 this year. Right now, we'll identify what certificate a device has. Um, and as you may or may not be aware, XIoT devices, embedded devices, you know, any device that has an IP address but can't take an agent, you know, it's purpose built, very low resource, and it's focused on usually about one or, or maybe a handful of things. Nine times out of 10, these devices, has a, they have a self-signed cert. So we'll identify that, we'll help you see that within your platform. Coming next quarter, we'll integrate with your certificate authority and allow you to deploy your own signed certificates to all of your XIoT devices. So you can get rid of all of those self-signed certificates. So another cool feature. Uh, and also prior to showing the reports, I just wanna show you how you can select all devices if you wish, perform actions, and you can do things like enroll in the privilege access management, rotate the passwords, install firmware. So you can do that in mass uh, very, very easily. And in fact, you can schedule it. So as you're going through the process of, you know, crawl, walk and run, the important part, do the discovery, get your arms around what you have now and what you have today. And as you're maturing down the line, what will ultimately happen is you'll get to a point where you feel pretty good. You've got all your XIoT devices enrolled and you're doing password management. You've changed the default password, which is a huge win initially. And now for compliance and regulatory reasons, you can change that password every 90 days. You can schedule that. You don't even have to come back to the platform. Let's check on our phone. It's uh, getting the network up. So it's actually getting close to being done here. So let's go back to reports here. So number one, this is a report on alert history. Pretty simple and straightforward. I call this, you know, the why we bought phosphorus and the justif justification report, which, you know, you start with this many alerts and you get down really low, right? Easy. Another one down here I like to hit, this is really my favorite, uh, is discontinued devices. So with discontinued devices, this could really be a very simple product in of itself because when you talk about XIoT, because they're purpose-built devices, what usually happens is an organization or an individual or some party comes in to that environment and says, okay, I'm gonna install cameras. I'm gonna install temperature sensors. I'm gonna install door controllers. They do that task and they leave. And oftentimes it may be managed in the sense that, like with printers, right, someone comes and refills the ink and, and you know fixes things once in a while, but it's not managed in the sense that from a cybersecurity perspective, people like you and I, we wanna make sure that we address issues with our attack surface, right? And so this helps you see discontinued devices, which are devices that are no longer gonna get new firmware, which means vulnerabilities will continue to exist and not be patched. And it means you have no, you're no longer gonna get any support if there's a hardware issue. So for both of those, there are serious problems, especially when you look here, there's three APC devices, which are UPSs that are out of date. So number one, 
that's not good. And if I go back to my firmware overview, which I haven't showed you yet, I like this one. I can show you just how old the firmware is. I've got one of those UPSs that's got an 11-year-old firmware. So if it's on your network with an 11-year-old firmware, do you think that the battery has been rotated out every three years? Probably not. So those are the types of scenarios where you start uncovering layers and layers of debt, which could lead to, you know, next time you have a power outage, you might have a UPS that instead of giving you, you know, 45 minutes of power to get through, you know, a really small outage, you might be talking about only a couple minutes because the battery is so old. So this is pretty important, helping you identify what's dis discontinued. And then here from a firmware overview, helping you see how many versions behind you are, is there a critical CDE, that type of information to help you with your punch list. Cause that is one thing we do certainly give you homework, you know, the visibility into what's happening in your environment, but we make it easy because we actually can remediate unlike other platforms out there that tell you stuff and it's only detect and respond. We'll help you get through this, you and I together. Other area here is a security overview. So this used to be kind of my favorite place to land uh, before we added this really nice dashboard, because this really is the overall view of why XIoT can really be an attack surface problem. So just in my lab here, which you can see, I've got uh, 54 devices with default credentials. That's 35% of all devices. And I've got 11% of those with a critical CVE. Now, a vulnerability like that is not just, you know, a big vulnerability, it's also exploitable, meaning it's out there. Someone can go and use it, uh, which is fine, right? But when I'm thinking XIoT, my approach is always, I'm gonna use Google and a model name because look at all these default credentials, right? Why use an exotic downloadable exploit, which isn't exotic at all, right? But I can just use admin, admin, or whatever password, right? So this is the type of thing that happens and we break it out you know, by device and criticality and, and all that good stuff. Uh, similarly for alerts, same thing, you know, you've got red, you've got orange, you've got uh, beige for low, uh, and so on. So it kind of gives you a, a view into where you are and how you're doing. So let's check on our phone here. It's starting up here, so it's uh, getting there. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty much wrapping up here now. Another thing that I like to cover quickly here is sites. So what you're seeing. Uh, with this screen is the Phosphorus uh, Cybersecurity kind of site manager. So this is a, an, an appliance. It can be virtual. It can be physical. Uh, it can be your singular discovery platform. Uh, if you have a flat network or a smaller network, or if you deploy this onto a laptop and you know just use it for discovery, no problem. But most environments, as you can see here, you've got multiple sites. Now in our lab, we've got some of these down at this moment, but these are remote uh, discovery, essentially drones or appliances. And all it is is a, a Linux executable that can be deployed on an existing appliance or, an, or a server, or you can use one of our appliances. Uh, and you can use that so you don't have to, you know, update all kinds of ACLs on your firewall, or, you know, maybe you have a, a geographic concern, you've got, you know, presence in Germany or some other place where there's different types of concerns, you can make sure that the discovery is done there locally. And then it's just a singular TCP 443 connection back to this console. And we can do all the remediation that we do from here. And then as you can see, if you have those multiple sites, you can then sort on that site, which allows you to report and all that. And as you can see here, this just popped up um, that we went ahead and we got that uh, firmware updated. So I'm gonna find this the lazy way. And now it is uh, still out of date firmware because I updated it to the middle one, as you can see, not to the biggest. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do a downgrade here just to close that loop and let that go. And at this point, I'm open for questions uh, and I can you know, certainly go on, but uh, I thank you for, for attending.
Okay, I have uh, some questions coming in. This is, thank you guys for your patience. This is kind of unique. I'm getting them via uh, Slack. <laughs> um, is there a way to find out if any device is tampered with physically? Um, so, I mean, there's kind of an asterisk there with this, with this answer. So a couple things, right? If that device, and a lot of them do, when they're embed embedded kind of purpose uh, built devices, uh, if that device has a methodology to to uh, essentially alert or change its state uh, to let us know that it has been tampered with, then yes. So if there's a log or some other you know change that's identified as part of that device changing, it's very likely that we could change that. We could understand that. Now, if you're going, you know, usually when people are asking those types of questions with those types of devices. Like it could be, you know, fire monitoring or fire controls, things like that. At least in the U.S., we actually are not allowed to make changes to those devices at all. So it would really be uh, t detect and respond only for that type of device because of uh, uh, legality. Um, yeah. So do do we scrape uh, more than just miter? So yeah, we actually. Uh, look at multiple av avenues. So actually, we're not necessarily looking at, you know, we're getting the CVEs from MITRE as that source, but we also are getting our data from vendors as well. So as you can imagine, right, it's kind of a multi-phase process. In order to understand that there's a vulnerability that exists within a device, our scraping, which happens consistently, you know, we're looking at these uh, vendors, uh, websites, we're looking for new firmware to not only download, but also to analyze. And so part of that is we see the new firmware, we'll identify the, the challenges or the vulnerabilities that are addressed. And that's also what we'll, we'll show within the platform. So um, all of our identification of vulnerabilities is done 100% passively based on our threat intelligence and CDE and other components, the vendor itself, uh, because we're doing discovery very, very lightly and essentially looking at banners and other characteristics of devices because as you may or may not know, these embedded devices, these XIoT devices, they're chatty, they're very chatty. They're happy if you query them and they'll say, hello, I'm this and I'm running that and I've been up for this long, you know, so it's, it's very easy to get that information. Any other uh, questions? I can't hear you guys. I'm just, and I can't see you guys. So I'm just picturing a standing ovation with thunderous applause. <laughs> Okay, I have another question here. Are uh, most of the supported devices in partnership with the manufacturers? Do you guys sniff MQT? So uh, first question related to partnership, um, it can be yes and no. So we're able to actually grab uh, a lot of this information publicly and we do so. However, uh, as we're now, my background is OT. I actually come from a, a organization called Nozomi Networks. Um, as we're getting more into that area, um, that's where partnerships are really important because if you're familiar with updating like PLCs and things like that, you know, you're going to be in the realm of, you know, you have to have proprietary software to update them. You have to have a subscription to get the files. And so in those cases, we're definitely going kind of the official route. Um, we do uh, sniff MQTT. I'm trying to think. I don't know if I have any examples here. Um, I may not have anything offhand, but that's something that is, uh, yeah, not not a problem. We can we can communicate with that and and pull data from that. Okay, so I got a question. What kind of useful information for devices that don't have a nice API for changing passwords and upgrades? Great question. So. 
Uh, an API is actually not necessary. We have devices where we don't like doing this, but that we have to communicate with over Telnet to do password changes. Now, you, you know, we are a security platform, so we're gonna tell you that that's an insecure configuration, but if a device only supports that, there's only so much we can do. So um, let me find a, I think I've got a, here's a good example, right? So this is a Rockwell Automation PLC, uh, very near and dear to my heart from my past. It's a MicroLogix 1400. Um, we are able to understand what it is, and you can see it's based on uh, the protocols, the ports, because again, it's very communicative. You can see we don't support firmware updates. Now, when I talked about the crawl, walk, and run modality, and when I talk to my friends from the OT industry based on my past, I'm not coming in telling people, hey, we're gonna update the firmware on all of your PLCs day one, right? Absolutely not. That's not something we wanna do. You know, Safety and reliability is paramount in OT. And so from that perspective, where we really come into play is we do discovery quickly and safely without the need for a span or a mirror or any other kind of heavy lift on the network side, right? So what I've always found with my experience with passive tools that use span and mirror is it takes a long time to get that configured and get that going. And even if you're able to get it done quickly, that's really only one site or one switch. You have to have a ton of different switches to get the right data. With our platform, you can literally install us on an end user's workstation using VMware Player or you know whatever it may be, connect to the VPN and do discovery and find everything. And you'll get this level of fidelity with devices, whether we can do the fun stuff or not. We can actually do password change here, which is really cool. Um, but you know, it, it's not always that we can support a device fully, uh, but we are able to add full support for devices in most cases in a week or two. Uh, we have a incredible team. Um, one thing that I actually didn't mention during the demonstration, because usually there's interactivity. Um, oh, there's my downgrade that went successfully. But we support the reason that, you know, we, we actually came out of stealth last year. We took four years uh, developing what we call the genus and species model. And that model is important because what we found when you, you know, look at a printer, for example, like HP up here, um, one vendor, their support for XIoT devices is very similar across their entire line. So what we found is their distribution is similar, the way that you communicate them with is, is similar, et cetera. So a consumer printer, a corporate printer, you know, a, a whatever else HP makes, which I know is a lot, I just can't think of anything. HP can be at the top there and there can be six subspecies that apply to all of HP, which then translates to us supporting another 10,000 devices. So it's very powerful, that methodology that we use. And so that's one reason why I like you know, you might see devices in here, like a Cisco switch. We know a lot about it, but you can see all we support is password change there, right? Our discovery is is actually incredibly uh, high fidelity and it, it beats probably most other platforms out there and it's quick and it's easy. So you don't have to jump right into kind of be, you know, let me change passwords, let me do all that. You certainly can evolve and mature into it. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate you guys all coming. I uh, wish I could uh, have a beer with you. I'm in uh, Minnesota, so you guys have a have a great time there in uh, Calgary tonight. Or if you're heading home, be safe. Appreciate the time.